Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Writer's Block, a short web series where we discuss writing tips, primarily for Fordham University students, but really for writers anywhere. Um, and today we're getting started with getting things started. Um, we're talking introductions, and that's introductory paragraphs, introductory sections, um, and just in general, getting your reader to start going through your thoughts. Ellis, what do you think? So this is one of the areas that every writer struggles with because it's really hard to begin something when you haven't written it yet, right? When your ideas are not fully formed yet, it's hard to sit down at the blank page and figure out how to write an introduction. So today's video will give you just a few hints and pointers, etc., that we hope will help you craft just really gorgeous intros for your next college paper. Yeah, I like that you pointed out that, that um, you know, it's crafting an introduction. That's not necessarily starting your writing. Um, I personally, as an author, will write uh, like my core teaching bits first, examine my evidence before I ever really write an introduction. Oftentimes an introduction is the last thing that I'll write. So crafting it kind of requires knowing where the rest of your paper is going to go. And if you don't know where that is yet, put off writing your introduction. That's totally fine. Um, but the intro itself is kind of its own specific art where you show just exactly what's going to be happening for later on for the reader. It's sort of a promise to what you'll get to for the reader. Yes, absolutely. So it's great to budget time in at the end of your paper writing so that you can always return to the introduction and revise. Great writers know also that uh, an effective introduction will, as you said, Cahal, will set up those expectations for the reader and give your reader a sense of what your argument is, what your approach is, right from the very beginning. Yeah. So it'll capture their attention, but it'll also give them a preview, not necessarily a summary, but just a little preview of the paper's major themes and highlight your argument. So it will help guide your readers to important ideas that you'll cover and give maybe a little background information. Um, but every idea in that introduction should be returning to your argument and have relevance to some, some idea or some claim that you make later on in your paper. Absolutely. And Introductions change widely depending on the length of your paper, but a solid rule that I've gone with and that I teach my students is that an introduction should be about one-fifth of whatever the total paper length is, because that's about the amount of time that you need to kind of, if it's going to be a longer essay, pre-teach any ideas that you might have to do, put down, you know, the, the theories or methods that you're using um, really quickly so that someone scanning over the paper is going to be able to know what it's about. But it's also uh, just to give the weight of whatever argument is going on. Like, kind of let us know how important it is. If you can't sum it up in about 20% of the paper, about one-fifth, then you need to condense it down a bit. And if you're only doing it in, you know, 5%, then maybe you need to readjust the length of your essay in general. Or expand the ideas that you're doing and press on to why they matter a bit more. Yeah. So let's look at some concrete examples of student writing to talk about common pitfalls that people make with introductions and what kinds of things you want to aim for, but also what types of things you might want to avoid. So Cahal, will you read that first paragraph for me? Please? Sure, absolutely. Power comes not from knowledge kept, but from knowledge shared. For, the, for centuries, knowledge has been at the center of how society is formed and is one of the most important resources throughout the world. From ancient Greek philosophers, such as Plato and Socrates, talking about human nature and gaining numerous followers, to technology moguls such as Bill Gates and the late Steve Jobs dominating the technology industry, all of their influence can be traced back to knowledge. However, in order to obtain knowledge, one must receive an end education through schooling. In the United States, the government has set up an extensive public school system that hosts millions of children throughout numerous public schools across all states. Although these public schools are supposed to provide students with a quality education experience, 
Oftentimes, money isn't properly allocated to public schools, which results in unequal funding in many schools. Thank you. So one of the most common pitfalls that people make is just being too fluffy or broad in their introductions and including unnecessary or irrelevant information. So I think since so many people have so much trouble with just beginning their essay, sometimes uh, you Google around, right, until you find a quote, or maybe like a, you look up your main topic, you look up knowledge in the dictionary, and you start with the dictionary definition of knowledge, um, or you use that Bill Gates quote, right? So uh, that can be one way to assuage the anxiety. Um, it might help you understand the concept of knowledge a little better in your research process, but this essay probably isn't going to engage with Bill Gates or like his theory of knowledge um, or with the entirety of the history of knowledge, right? It's not going to cover all those centuries or uh, throughout the world, the history of knowledge from Plato all the way to Steve Jobs. Um, so yeah, I think... Um... I think the just looking at the start of the paragraph and the end of the paragraph, we can't really see a logical progression between the two. I mean, it ends on a, a an idea of public funding, right? The, the, it's a money question that we end with, not an information question. And so to frame the essay as though this is a knowledge issue or an education issue, that's not really quite what they're getting at. We end with this is a funding issue and an inadequate like funding issue. So, right. and it isn't for, until the very end that we realize that, oh, this paper is about unequal funding in public schools, but that absolutely isn't clear from those first couple sentences. Yeah, and one of the, one of the pitfalls of these like very large inventing the universe kind of questions, uh, kind of essay openers, is that oftentimes it just leaves big holes in an argument. For instance, from ancient Greek philosophers as Plato and Socrates, well, is that really the from point? Is that the start point? Is that when knowledge was created? Because I, I think ancient Egypt and prehistoric humans had, you know, they, it, it's whenever you do these sort of like wide opening things, it leaves a lot of places for people to just kind of poke holes. Um, and it's because we're trying to, to sit down and condense our thoughts really, really quickly. Um, but oftentimes it's better to start from a narrow place, like a specific example, and then open up. Um, so if we wanted to talk about Plato and Socrates, we'll maybe talk about Socrates giving free lessons, right? And that's the foundation of a free, and you could work out from there, Yeah. talking about a public school. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, the one exception to this might be if there's an example or a quote um, that does directly relate to your argument, right? So for example, in a literature paper where you might begin with a quote that exemplifies your argument, brings up interesting questions, but questions that you're going to answer over the course of your paper, right? So if you're going to use a quote or an example, then it should be evocative of your larger argument, and you should explain in your introduction how that quote relates to your argument directly. So sometimes it can give your reader an example of how you're using the text to make your argument, but don't use a quote as a filler or if you're just trying to find something, anything to introduce your paper with, it should yeah. only relate to your argument specifically. I will say that this is a very specific like Western cultural thing that we don't start with a quote and that in East Asia, it's actually very common to start and rely on quotes in your, your papers. You kind of like let them sit and stand. It's just more of a Western university sort of a thing. Um, but we would say, even if you did use a quote at all in the beginning, it needs to have your argument in context around it. You would never do what we have here, which is a dropped quote, which just sat on the page. Um, and, you know, that, that could be as simple as, uh, I believe that uh, the core of a good education is what Bill Gates says here, that knowledge shared. Um, and the best way to share knowledge is through free public schooling, right? And then we've got an argument that sets out where this paper's going to go. And use the same quote, sure, 
but use the quote to back where your argument is going to be going. Yes. So uh, on that note, do you want to move to the second example that we have? Absolutely. Would you mind reading this out, out, out loud, Ellis? And let me know if there's any names or anything that might be a little bit difficult. <laughs> sure. There is an overall consensus on what each issue of the kaiju represent. In the case of Gojira, Steve Reifel, one of the world's leading authorities on kaiju films, and Peter H. Brothers, a published novelist specializing in Godzilla, both argue that Godzilla is a negative, fearful metaphor for nuclear destruction and warfare. An interview with Peter Serretta from Slash Film and Pacific Rim's director, Guillermo del Toro, reveals that the kaiju in his films are meant to be, quote, charging forces of nature, but were not further described. Finally, Alyssa Wilkins, Box's film critic and culture reporter, argues that Colossal's kaiju is an incarnation of addiction, guilt, and unhealthy relationships. So the reason I chose this paragraph, Ellis, is that it's doing something that we see a lot which is this kind of review of literature as an opening, kind of um, putting all the work that the author has done researching the topic up front. And a lot of times students will feel that this is a, a good move because it shows how much they know about the subject. But that's kind of the opposite of what happens because rather than showing us how much they know about the subject, it shows how much everyone else knows about the subject. Yeah, exactly. I think the key here is that we don't actually get a sense in this paragraph of what this author's, what this particular student's argument is, right? What is their idea about these films? Um, we know what many of these authorities' ideas are, but we don't ever get a real sense of what their argument is. So your introduction can be a place where you give your readers a sense of your approach and your argument as well as your perspective on the topic, right? They're going to be really interested in what you have to say about it. And uh, a paragraph like this, where you're kind of giving these different authority perspectives on the genre, can come later on in the essay when you're yeah. approaching route. My suggestion to the student would be to actually push this down to a second or third paragraph. If we think back to the uneven you lessons that we did um, earlier on in the series, this is a very good you know, basis for a one or level two kind of paragraph. Um, the idea of teaching an overall consensus really shouldn't ever be in our introduction, simply because we're probably coming in to ask to complicate something or talk about a specific instance and how it pertains to something. Very rarely in college writing do we ask for a, a report, you know, give me an overall introduction to what this is and do, do the basic teaching and tell me everything in a very generalized sense. No one asks for that. You might get that in a business or if you're doing legal writing and you're like, well, do an overview of what these kind of cases do. But in argumentative writing, which is most college writing, this is doing exactly the opposite of what we want. There is no point here where the author actually comes in and says what they believe. And good humanities writing oftentimes is founded on what the perspective of the author is adding to the paper. Yeah, I'll also say that, um, especially in this particular example, I think this writer has a great opportunity to really capture the reader's attention since you know, kaiju and Godzilla, like that's such an exciting, evocative topic. So your intro can also be a place for you to show off a little bit about what is interesting to you about this topic um, and really drive that home for the reader and preview some of the exciting things that you'll argue later yeah. on in the essay. It's a great place to be a little bit creative, especially if you're dealing with something fantastical like Godzilla. Come in talking about, you know, places burning and things like this, and then maybe lead the expectation to it being Godzilla, but actually have it be a natural disaster or a consequence of human action. And then you've already created a parallel um, between the idea of kaiju representing something. Walking through that sort of metaphoric imagery might be more useful to the reader than a summary of sources. 
Yeah, so this is a great example of why it's great to go back and revise your introduction after you finish the paper draft, because this person may have started writing um, just, okay, info dump, what does my brain know about kaiju films? Um, and then their argument gets crystallized or clarified over the course of the essay. So make sure you always pay attention to revising your introduction as you draft your paper. Budget lots of time so you can return to your introduction after you've drafted the whole thing. And uh, that will help you con construct a really exciting introduction. After Absolutely. There's this, there's this great idea that gets tossed around a lot. And typically ideas that get tossed around a lot aren't particularly that great, but for writing, the idea that an introduction begins with the conclusion is really kind of the, the perfect introduction. If you know exactly where you want the reader to end, the introduction should hint at where that's going to be. Don't defer that like this is your big argument. It will say what the big argument is and then say, here's how we're going to get there. You know, and that is, you, you don't want to start a, a road trip without a map. You don't want to start you know, any sort of long journey without a sense of where you're going and what's in front of you. As a reader, if you come across 20 pages of writing and you don't know why you're reading it, that's a bad, that's a bad time for you. Um, and as a writer, you're failing to do your job. Yeah, so we hope this has given you a sense of a couple of things that great introductions do in terms of setting up readerly expectations and capturing the reader's attention. And uh, we'll see you next week. All right. Stay awesome, everyone. Bye.